Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. I think we'll get started. It's great to see so many people attending these webinars. We had over 120 registrants, so that's really impressive level of interest in our topic of the day. Today, it's all about groundwater traces, and we're lucky to have Frederick Cosme from Geosyntec Consultants to present to us on this topic. And uh, I'm sure it will be of interest to many of you. Before we get started, I'll just run through the outline of the day and a few administrative things. So I'm uh, speaking to you now. My name is Richard Campbell. I'm the Managing Director of HydroTerra. Our presenter today is Frederick Cosme, and he's a principal from Geosyntec Consultants. Uh, we really appreciate you presenting here today, Fred. And Jury is a field technician with HydroTura, and he's going to be handling the Q&A at the end of the session today. Before we get started, if you have a question, and we do love your questions, that's a big part of why we are here today, please use the Q&A button that's at the top of the screen. That would be excellent. Just put all your comments in there, uh, not in the chat, but in the Q&A, and we will endeavour to answer those questions at the end of this webinar. A little uh, reason, summary of reasons why we like to provide these webinars. HydroTerra really believes that knowledge sharing is very important and we like to facilitate it. So today I think it's a great learning experience opportunity from a real specialist in the area of hydrogeology. Uh, we also like to facilitate education and I think this is a topic that uh, probably needs more training than we have out there. I know there's a few hydrogeology courses, but not many that would cover the use of traces. So it's one of those topics where education is lagging a bit behind industry need. And finally, we like to take a leadership position in the industry as we develop our marketplace for environmental monitoring. Today's webinar. So, Fred's going to cover several things in this presentation today. Uh, firstly, the differences between applied and environmental traces. Secondly, the key principles for applied tracer tests, their applications, future developments of these tests, monitoring technologies utilised, and the availability of traces in Australia. Now, as and within HydroTerra, we obviously have a range of equipment for monitoring, and we also do organise from time to time those traces that are used in these tracer tests. So when you're looking to conduct a tracer test, feel free to give us a call and we'll do our best to help you out at that side of things. But uh, I suppose we should introduce the speaker of the day. So. What do we know about Frederick Cosme? Well, Fred started his career as an agricultural engineer uh, training in Brussels. Uh, well, he did his training and then he thought, no, agricultural engineering is not quite for me. So he went on and did geological engineering as well uh, with a major in hydrogeology. Fred then embraced the world of consulting, leaving university in 1999 and uh, really has had a career focused on contaminant hydrogeology since then. I was lucky enough to work with uh, Fred in Golder Associates about 15 years ago, where we were both in the hydrogeology group. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have Fred here to present to you today. Fred's uh, also been heavily involved in the industry, working or um, uh, well, volunteering his time for ALGA, and he was the involved with the founding of the Groundwater Fate and Transport Group within ALGA. He's passionate about nature, and uh, his wife is passionate about making cheese, so he spends a lot of time building 
uh, their local cheese facility up in their property. Um, so without further ado, I will pass over to Fred for our topic of the day, applied groundwater tracing, another type of aquifer test. Hello, I hope you can hear me all. If I haven't received any signal for from Hydroterra, that means it's working, which is great. Um, so thank you very much um, for attending the webinar today. Um, is, and thanks Richard for this lovely introduction. Um, uh, so today I'm going to talk about applied groundwater tracing and, and hopefully um, give you a bit of a sense for the possibilities in terms of aquifer test. Um, let's see whether technology delivers. It does. Um, so we're going to start with uh, an introduction. Um, and uh, where I will essentially give you a bit of a difference between what I call applied tracers and environmental tracers. Um, then the bulk of the presentation today is focused on really what I love doing, which is uh, applied tracers, but you can equally achieve similar outcomes using environmental tracers. And there are some pretty amazing specialists in Australia who can do that sort of stuff. Um, so I'm going to concentrate on applied tracer, just give you some ideas about how to do that, what sort of monitoring devices you need, how to think about a tracer test, we're going to go through then three main uh, applications and um, and such that you can see some real life example and uh, and how to, uh, to to get some really interesting information and useful and practical um, when you do a tracer test. So um so, th so there is a possibly a bit of a confusion in the industry, but there are, there are two types of tracers. There is the the, the applied tracers, um, which is essentially what I've done as long as I've been graduated as a hydrogeologist. Um, and, and these are voluntarily introduced in groundwater. Something that is great about that is we know the quantity. And, and because we know the quantity, it's, it's more controlled. Um, so some example of that, um, you probably you may have heard about bromide because it's a relatively conventional applied tracer. Um, and um, you can also use um, fluorescent dye like fluorescein, uh, which is also a very common applied tracer. And then you have the environmental tracers. They are already present in groundwater. Uh, and like uh, one of my friends um, at CSRO says, they are freely available <laughs> in nature. Um, unfortunately, they, there is an unknown quantity of those tracers and, and, and therefore it's less control. Uh, but an example of that, um, classically, you've got the major ions, contaminants are um, great tracers um, in isotopes. Um, so one of the things you need to ask yourself, the question which is really important in hydrogeology too, is at what scale do you need to work? Um, do you want to do uh, and assess a localized zone because you've got some D-napple or some napple somewhere and you want to try to understand um, how the local zone works? You may want to work at the side of a plume uh, maybe you want to go bigger in a big site, um, or you want to work with a catchment. Um, obviously, when you introduce voluntarily a tracer, you it's it, groundwater travel relatively slowly, so so often you limit it to the scale that you can work on, which is typically more the local zone or the plume zone or the site. You rarely use uh, applied tracers at the catchment scale. But that being said, I've done that in aquifers that were that were pretty permeable, uh, like cast, and then you can truly use that at a catchment scale, and it can be great fun too. Um, but always, when you do 
you, you design a tracer test, think about the scale, think about the anticipated velocity of groundwater, because that's what is going to determine um, your tracer test. Um, other considerations when you do a tracer test, well, obviously at the end of the day, there is a cost to an answer that you are trying to a question that you're trying to answer. Um, and that that question has a price <laughs> and 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 especially any sensor in particular. There, there are obviously side constraints that you need to think about. Um, so the build environment, um, some of the existing wells, etc. The aquifer conditions, of course, um, that determine the the, the hydrodynamic of the aquifer. Detection limits um, are a pretty important component because it's um, it's really affecting your ability to detect a tracer. Um, whether you want some laboratory or field analysis, some sampling methods, um, you may want, I mean, you would want to look at the background concentrations, even with some of the fluorescent dye, um, the, some organic matter, certain contaminants can fluoresce and can interfere with your tracer test. It's always good to have a strong quality assurance, quality control um, uh, protocol and, um, and some idea of the spatial and temporal distribution of whatever you're trying to understand. Um, and so as someone says often to me, <laughs> which I'm repeating here, it's important to begin with the end in mind and, and ultimately come up with hypotheses to design your data collection. Um, a lot of um, a lot of things that we do as uh, practitioners is we're just trying to come up with a hypothesis, uh, an hypothesis, and we test that hypothesis. Um, and uh, hopefully, you will understand why why it's important um, further in the presentation that it's it's almost a discipline uh, that you need to acquire when you do tracer tests in particular. So um, apply tracers. Um, yeah, so we're going to go through some key principles um, and, and how to basically do some tracer test. Um, then we'll go and talk about three case studies. Um, the first one is really what got me into tracer test um, and it's called protection zone. Another one about groundwater recharge, which is a really um, nice story. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about effective porosity using an example um, very close to all part of the world in the western suburbs of Melbourne. Then, you know, some conclusion and uh, future development. So what, what's the basic idea? Um, well, essentially you dissolve a known quantity of tracer in water. And you introduce the solution into an aquifer via typically an injection well, but you don't have to limit yourself to that. You can do that into uh, a sinkhole, that's pretty fun, <laughs> a subsurface vault, a pond, a dam, you know, ultimately anything that can get you to the system. You can also do that through the unsaturated zone, but um, it will pop possibly slow down and complicate your tracer test. So you may want to steer away from that. And then what you do is you monitor the changes in tracer concentration to obtain breakthrough curves, which is the little nice graph that you have here um, on the left hand side with on the one hand, um, the concentration in tracer with the time that you the time since injection um, that you monitor in a particular um, portion of the system. In practice, it seems easy, um, but uh, tracer test uh, methodology can be quite sophisticated. And, and you will see that some of the results can be highly dependent upon the adopted methodology. Um, and, um, and sometimes, and maybe it's something you need to really think about, sometimes it seems too easy. <laughs> and, um, and I think part of the reason um, some of the tracer techniques, I think in Australia have lost some of the, 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 the interest, um, which is as early as, a, as the 70s and, and 80s was essentially having probably the, um, the, the notion that it was too easy, you chuck a tracer somewhere and you hope for the best and 
nothing happened. You don't find a tracer, it disappears, and, um, and you don't necessarily achieve what you want to achieve, which is not really an outcome that you want to uh, reach when you do a tracer test. You want to actually prove your hypothesis and you want to verify something. So there, there, there are three main types of tracers for, for your information. Um, the, the, the one that is probably more conventional and older is uh, our salt. Um, analysis of salts is pretty conventional, but it has a higher detection limit. Think about 10 to 100 microgram per liter. Background is high, especially in some of our aquifers in um, Southeast Australia, being quite saline. And you can need quite a bit of salt um, to do a tracer test in the order of a few kilos sometimes, which can bring some issues about the toxicity due, due to the excess that you need to bring. Um, what I love are the fluorescent dyes here in the middle um, because they have a very low detection limit. It can be as low as 0.001 microgram per liter. Um, yeah, sure, you need to um, reduce some issues, um, address some background and interferences. Um, something I really want to stress on, and one of the examples will support that, they are in a cruise, right? Um, there are some publications that um, support that. And, um, in, uh, in, um, in, and you will see in one of the examples the context where it's used, and, and, and hopefully it will make you a little more comfortable. Um, and then you've got some of the nano, tra nano tracers. Um, uh, you even have bacteria and viruses. Um, that, that happens. The analysis is a little more unconventional. It, it's, it's really specific and it requires some risk, uh, risk assessment. So, um, so I wouldn't, you know, um, it's more for your information that you know that it's there, but it's not really the mainstream of tracer test. Um, so how do you take, so here are some of the great de uh, detection limit, typical of some of the fluorine tracer tests. Um, here at the top, you've got fluorescein. Um, that's the reason why it's pretty popular. It's because it's got one of the lowest detection limits, 0.02. Um, then you've got sulforodamine, 0.06, some eosine, tinopol. Um, I like amino G acid because that one is transparent. Uh, and so you don't see that and there's some advantage associated with that and a few other ones. Um, way to do a tracer test, well, you don't necessarily constrain yourself to very sophisticated monitoring. You can obviously detect that um, just visually, um, which, you know, in certain uh, circumstances would, um, would be good enough. Um, you, you have some fluoroscope. Um, uh, but then you can really get into the lower detection limit by using field fluorometer, which we will um, see what, what, what that can offer through a tracer test. You can use a spectrophotometer in the laboratory. And if you really need to achieve low detection limit, you've got active charcoal uh, where you really literally filter your water and then you get the charcoal, um, which is really a granular activated carbon um, tested. So what, one of my favorite tool, um, the gadget, <laughs> which um, um, is, is the high precision fluorometer. Um, as you can see, it looks like a data logger um, and it's designed to be placed inside groundwater uh, monitoring wells. Um, it's equipped with a data logger in a telemetry system and it has tracer specific sensors to that provide the possibility to test up to three different dyes at the same time and conduct multiple tracer tests. So that that that's not necessarily very new. Um, the first types of these fluorometer are dating nearly 20 years ago. Um, they start to be more and more I mean, multiple providers. This is just an example. There are others. Um, we can always talk about that if you have some interest. Um, there are some of those in Australia which can be rented. And um, and yeah, so um, so that that obviously cuts down on the time you need to sample overnight because <laughs> the tracer does that, and and the the, the cost to do the the lab testing. 
Um, so here is the, the first example of tracer test, which, which is essentially where I've got into tracer test. Um, you've probably heard from my accent that I wasn't born in Australia. Um, and something important is that many, many uh, European countries rely heavily on groundwater for their, for their potable um, water supply. Um, some areas are um, densely populated and there is a need to define protection zones inside which activities are regulated or prohibited, right? Um, and, and it's got to a point where when there is an accident that occurs, there is also a need to predict contaminant migration and support logistics of intervention. Um, so in most EU countries, uh, protection zones are typically defined using fluorescent dye tracers because they have this ability to quantify the effective porosity. And some of the hydros amongst you might recognize this equation where groundwater velocity is the product between the hydric conductivity, the hydric gradient divided by the effective porosity. Um, really wanted to focus on the fact that these fluorescent dyes are used in zones where people are drinking <laughs> the water from that aquifer. So, so if there, there was really some issue about toxicity, um, you, I would have thought the European would have known about that, but there is more literature that demonstrates that it's not a problem then. So, so, um, so yeah, um, why not using them? Um, this is a, a, a tracer test that I, 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 I had some involvement quite early in my career. Um, this image show a, uh, an alluvial aquifer. Um, as you can see, it, it's pretty much gravel um, and um, relatively homogeneous. Um, the, the layer here at yeah, that particular site, which was a groundwater ex, um, extraction station for potable water, uh, was about seven meters thick. Some pretty high uh, transmissivity, somewhere between 10 to the minus four and 10 to the minus one square meter per second. So, uh, you know, pretty, pretty high, especially. Um, and something important is the average storage coefficient uh, by doing a range of long-term pump tests was around 0 0.1. Um, if you remember, the, there is a rule of thumb that uh, for unconfined aquifer, um, you assume that the storage coefficient is essentially the drainable porosity of the aquifer, and therefore it's equivalent to the effective porosity. And that's how you try to calculate your groundwater velocity, and you try to define your, uh, uh, your protection zone around that. Um, what was interesting here is we did a number of tests at that site uh, with different tracers at increasing distances from the pumping well. We, we injected tracers um, and then essentially the exercise is almost like a pumping test. You've got a, a breakthrough curve and you, you try to fit that with a software um, and there are different softwares to um, and you try to calibrate your breakthrough curve against um, some form of model with different parameters, which helps you to derive, in this case, the effective porosity that and is then based to um, define how far you need to go to protect the, the zone around the water supply well. Um, what, um, what you can see already here is, remember, the specific yield was around 0.1 and so 10 percent and here you've got an effective porosity that is more that is lower and that um that is nearly sometimes a factor of two uh lower than that which means because it's inversely proportional to um to the, the velocity it means that in those cases if you use the specific yields uh, uh, to do your prediction, you're going to underestimate the velocity, the travel time to the web. So it's pretty important to try to get that right. Um, so why, why, um, 
so I mean, essentially, these these this is sort of repeating what I've said. But why is that the case? Um, and why do we have a, a, a lower effective porosity that is below the specific yield? Because you think, well, it should, the, the contaminant should travel through the whole drainable porosity. That's actually not the case because um, um, the contamination will follow the path of least resistance. And so it will really follow the, the highways, the more advective portion of the aquifer. And, and therefore the specific yield is more a bulk parameter than something that you can use to do some prediction. And some of you hopefully have done some <laughs> uh, numerical modeling and uh, have, um, have realized that um, maybe there is some improvement to bring when you do numerical model to, to possibly uh, reassess uh, how uh, the, the effective porosity for some, some of the calculation and fade and transport. Well, that's obviously an aquifer, it's a porous aquifer. Um, this is even more pronounced in fractured rock. <laughs> Um, for example, effective porosities as low as 0.03% have been measured in limestone. So, um, so think, think about that when you do a tracer test. Think about that when you do a fate and transport modeling um, and you assume a 30% effective porosity. I'd be happy to argue with you that um, it can be as low as 10%, if not less, even in porous medium. Um, that case study is um, some tracer test in unsaturated zone. Um, and the little picture here is actually a vineyard in Champagne. Um, so, um, so that's where you, 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 you cultivate the grapes for Champagne. Um, but um, what is fun about limestone, which is in some way not very different to uh, other media, media like basalt in, uh, in Victoria, it's a dual porosity medium. So you've got fracture and matrix. That is used pretty extensively also in the EU, especially in the UK, North, Northwest EU to, um, to as aquifer for potable uh, supply. And a key factor of that is vulnerability, because especially the migration of nitrogen and pesticides um, resulting from agricultural activities uh, through the unsaturated zone. So at, at the time, there was a need to better, uh, to better predict the recharge mechanism and integrate that into the vulnerability, vulnerability element. Um, so when, when um, that was a job that I did um, to support um, a PhD student at the time, um, but a PhD student now is a <laughs> professor of hydrogeology who is still a really good friend of mine. And he, we, we had that really great site where we had a number of uh, monitoring well screen in different parts of the unsaturated zone. And then we had a uh, groundwater extraction well, uh, which was pumping uh, groundwater. And so we, we did two tests um, using uh, one piezometer that uh, injecting the tracer in a monitoring well um, that um, had a distance of, of a vertical distance of 10 meter between the monitoring well in the unsaturated zone and the pumping well. Um, but we did two tests. Um, the first test, um, making around with my arrow, the, the first test um, involved um, uh, salt. And the mass injected was around 100 kilo. Um, that was mixed in a volume of 300 liter. But what we did here, we put, uh, essentially we put the hose down into the, the monitoring well, and that represented about a chaser, about 300 liter per hour. Um, that led to this um, breakthrough curve where essentially the tracer arrived in the pumping well through the unsaturated zone we started to get the first arrival after five hours and we hit the peak after 11 hours. So we were pretty happy, pretty quick response. Um, and, um, and, uh, and then we, the second part of the PhD thesis started where the second test involved a lower mass, 10 kilo. The volume injected was a lot lower, 30 liter. And in this case, we didn't put any chaser, right? So it just naturally migrated through the unsaturated zone without some support. And what was interesting for the exact same uh, 
test setting, but different injection circumstances, the, we only started to get uh, information and, and detection on the breakthrough curve about after about one year. And, and, and essentially, you know, uh, it took nearly three years to get to the peak. And by that time, our PhD student had to finish his uh, master thesis. So, so he was quite happy that, that he was there, but it took quite a long time. So wh why is, is that the case? Um, well, essentially, um, when, when the, in the first case, um, when we put a hose down the, the monitoring well, we literally saturated the unsaturated zone. But it's like we 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 had it's like we had an intensive rain, which uh, which um, used the active fractures um, to quickly um, uh, migrate the tracer across the unsaturated zone. Uh, the second case was more the one um, um, representative of a natural recharge where uh, the water went first through the matrix, the matrix blocks and, and the, the fractures were not really uh, driving the transport of uh, the, the, the tracer. And, um, and so so that was a really interesting experience because, you know, usually you, you think about recharge, people think, okay, well, it takes about a meter um, to, for the recharge front to move. And it's actually not the case in a number of, uh, depending on the pattern, the, 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 the groundwater contamination can migrate a lot quicker and, uh, and have some very different impact to uh, the, the aquifer and, uh, and the groundwater table. And, and I'm sure we will discover that at more and more at the moment because that's exactly what what's happening with PFAS <laughs> because PFAS can also, you know, it gets released in smaller quantities and I'm sure that it follows some of the rainfall pattern um, with some of the extra complication that PFAS likes to stick at the top of the saturated zone. But that's another story. Um, this is a test that we did in the fractured basalt um, in the western suburb of Melbourne. Um, I wanted to acknowledge my uh, my former colleagues from Golder, now WSP, in supporting um, this tracer test. And um, if they, they're actually an entity who have that um, uh, that. Um, fluorometer and and so if you're interested uh, i'm sure they can give you some contact and they can help you doing that but what what we wanted to do is demonstrate that we can do some of these tests in australia um what was what that was was a radially conversion test in fractured basalt so pretty similar to the same the first experiment where we had ext uh, uh, extraction wells and we injected the uh we injected the the tracer in a um, in a monitoring well within the zone of inference from that extraction well, um, that was in the context of a hydraulic containment system. We injected only twenty seven gram of fluorescein, so not a lot of quantity, which which you know proves that you know if you would have had to do that with salt, we would probably have to use you know uh, the maybe 10, 15 kilos, something like that. And we recovered that um, in the extraction well located at a distance of 17 meter away. And the extraction rate was 1.6 liter a second. Um, we had some contaminants that had fluorescing properties. Um, so we had to accommodate for that in, in our approach um, in the design of the tracer. Here is this, the lovely breakthrough curve. Um, we had the first arrival after six hours. Uh, the peak concentration arrival was in 40 hours and we monitored the tracer for about 16 days. So when you think about cost, um, we could use that with some data loggers is actually pretty cost effective. It's just, you know, it's two weeks of a data logger, um, a few grams of fluorescein and um, and what we were able to demonstrate in this case, we found that the effective fracture porosity of the basalt was around 1.3%. Uh, 
which um, pr proves that yes, in fractured rock, you can have some pretty low effective porosities. Um, and that is probably some, uh, that also means that there is a matrix porosity in basalt um, that that is there definitely, and that plays a role as a storage zone for the contamination. Um, but also think about if you do, you want to do some bioremediation or, or some in, rely on injection to try to get an idea of um, how much amendment you need in the ground, you're going to need a good estimate of the fractured porosity, and this is one of the best ways to do that. Um, so we went through the three examples. Um, hopefully you have realized by now that it's actually another toolbox to test aquifers. It's pretty versatile. Um, uh, there is nearly an infinite number of approaches. Um, as I said, there is this importance of developing a hypothesis to be tested. Um, I've honestly showed some tracers that went wrong, but a lot of the, the ones that didn't is because the conceptual site model wasn't necessarily um, uh, robust <laughs> and, uh, and the tracer were in a different direction to what it was supposed to be. So if you do a tracer test, make sure you are happy with your trace, your CSM or um, um, be, be, be open to um, be open to, to what I call the, what we call the tracer truth. Um, so, and then designing a, a, a trace and applied tracer test is really about verifying this hypothesis and bringing all these considerations about uh, of the design, especially in the injection approach, the tracer choice, the tracer monitoring, and the QA QC. Um, I would just want to finish off, and that will give us plenty of time for the question with uh, some future development about tracers. One that I, I am particularly fond of um, is called Rizazarine. Uh, Rizazarine is a fluorescent dye tracer that changes its fluorescing properties according to the redox potential. Um, so so it, it, it can, when it gets in, in oxidizing condition, um, it has certain properties. When it gets in reducing condition, it changes to other properties and you can really differentiate these conditions using that sort of tracer. Um, it's been used to assess groundwater surface water interaction. Um, in particular, you've got to realize that um, the layer um, where there is interaction between groundwater and surface water uh, is actually a zone that is highly reactive uh, with lots of bacteria. And, uh, and therefore you've got a, often a gradient uh, of, of strong um, redox, different redox condition. And, uh, and it's been used to try to map that out. Um, so, but I can see how that could be used to help um, other applications um, um, when you think about bioremediation or natural attenuation and you want to quantify it a little more uh, some of that within your aquifer. Um, that's it. That's it. So um, I think I will hand over to Richard and and his team, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Well, thanks, Fred, for that excellent presentation. I think there's a lot of great information, and I'm sure the audience really appreciated what you had to say there today. Uh, from my perspective, there's a few things that uh, um, I would like to mention in terms of key takeaways from today. Now, often uh, as hydrogeologists, we create these conceptual models of sites. But in the end, sometimes we just need to really have a definitive answer of whether or not there is actually a flow path where we think there's one. You know, we make a lot of assumptions as hydrogeologists and tracer tests are one of the few truly definitive ways of determining whether or not there is actually a flow path there. So I think it's a great way to determine that. 
Second thing is be brave. A lot of people get a bit scared off with tracer tests, I find, you know, injecting dyes into the ground and things like that. But be brave because they are worth doing and they are a very, very robust way of determining some things about groundwater flow paths. Finally, they're actually pretty cost effective. So you think about all the other things we do in terms of characterizing groundwater, like numerical modeling, that sort of things. I mean, they're a very practical way to determine quite a lot. So give them a go, I say. Um, so without further ado, I'm sure you've got plenty of questions. Uh, Churi's going to run you through those uh, questions with Fred and uh, hopefully we can answer those questions for you today. If we can't, we will uh, take them on notice and do our best to get back to you as quickly as possible. Without further ado, over to you, Churi. All right. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, thank you very much, Fred. That was uh, very interesting. And there's a couple of questions here. This first, um, there's a few comments uh, in the chat uh, from Claire, from Gareth, and Stephen, Mike. They're all saying thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation. They learned a lot. Um, there is a question here from Mike um, asking, are all of the active tracer tests required to have an EPA approval? Well, um, I think that that's a really good idea. Um, I'm just not sure the start of the conversation needs to be with EPA. Um, my understanding is um, the, 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 the water authorities um, have actually authority to protect um, their groundwater resources um, associated with the ball construction license and that sort of stuff. So um, they would be the one I would tend to uh, reach out first, um, depending on the circumstances, of course. Um, and then, um, and then, uh, and then bring EPA along um, in, in some ways, but it, I think it, it, things have changed in terms of, there has been a change in guideline for the injection of remediation chemical. Um, you could somehow look at that in a, in a similar way. Uh, and what that means is um, EPA is not really involved in an approval process. They want to make sure that you comply with the guidelines, depending on the stakeholders and auditors, you may want to get them involved in the, the support um, and then just make sure you have the authority across that. Um, but I have a discussion with EPA. We went to present that there was a strong interest in doing these sorts of um, tests. And, um, and so, um, and there is enough literature to demonstrate that um, they are, uh, they are in a cruise. I hope that answers that question. And there's also a kind of to follow along on that question. There's another one from, uh, Yelaine, Yelaney, sorry about pronounce the pronunciation of your name. Um, uh, she also says, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, and they're also wondering, um, what is your experience with regu regulatory approval in Australia for these tracers? I know you just um, covered that briefly, but is there anything more specific you can add to that? Look, I, I think, I mean, at the end of the day, um... It, it, it varies, <laughs> it varies, but I, I think I think the main point of start is um, it's also a matter of discussing with um, the relevant stakeholders <laughs> and uh, and then identify who these stakeholders are. Um, and um, then, because in some circumstances, um, you know, um, um, they will, they, they, they may not necessarily need to have regulatory approval um, and um, and it's just making sure we're doing the right thing <laughs> right um, but I've, I've done some some tracer tests in South Australia um, we for that particular site we didn't necessarily need 
to go to the regulator, um, but we presented the, the tracer test afterwards, and they were pretty happy to have that um, as, uh, as a pretty strong line of evidence. Um, so, um, so I would look, I would be saying, you know, um, yes, let's make sure that everyone is on board. <laughs> let's make sure that um, we, we have the right approvals, but let's also be conscious that um, um, we, we, the, the risks are also limited and, and, um, and you know, what, what is the benefit that you get out of a tracer test versus, you know, leaving some contamination there with a very poor knowledge about how it impacts some receptors. And, um, and I think perhaps, I mean, <laughs> that's a debate and that depends on what the other questions are, but, but I think we, we need to, in our industry, we also need, in some ways, um, we are a bit like um, doctors of human nature and we need to perform surgery. And, um, and when you do something like that, well, um, there, there are consequences in what you're doing, but it's still about trying to do the right thing. <laughs> um, and does the, the surgeon always need to get approval from his regulator to perform surgery? Um, I think it depends on some of the cases, but, um, but I think, um, I think we also practitioners and we, we need to, it's really about doing the right thing and making sure the stakeholders are on board. All righty. A um, couple of technical questions here. Um, is a typical injection bore a 50 mil bore usually? Oh, um, yeah, look, I, I think that that seems about right. You can do that with smaller bores. Um, I think what the, the big question is how it's not so much, it's not so much about the typical injection bore. To me, it's about how do you want to deliver the tracer? And, and there are two ways. Either you have a very short lived pulse that you want to deliver, uh, which is what we did in the third um, uh, example. Uh, or do you want to deliver a relatively constant flow of tracer? Um, and then think about that in terms of what you're trying to achieve. Um, when you do the more classical one is just a pulse. For, for that, you know, at the end of the day, it's really about mixing the tracer with the right volume. You really think about the well volume and you try to have a chaser that is enough to make sure that it's pushing the well volume out of the aquifer. Um, that that's really more important. Then obviously there is some consideration around connectivity with the bore, but hopefully if you're a good hydrogeologist, you have well developed your well. <laughs> you haven't done that with a baler. You've done that possibly with a bit of hair lift, um, such that you are sure that it's 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 actually going in the formation. All right. Um, another question: uh, with the various case studies that you talked about. Do you think that any of these would have also benefited from using environmental tracer methods in combination with the applied tracers? Yes, <laughs> more data is always fun. Um, let me think about each of them. Um, yeah, I'm just not sure with the with the the, the first case and the second case whether you know you want. You want to have some precision about the effective porosity, because um, in the first case, it's really about defining your protection zone, so your transfer time. And in the third case, it's really about uh, the effective porosity and therefore, you know, the potentially if it's remediation, the quantity of amendment you want to uh, inject. And, um, and precision means, um, not to have too many unknown in the equation and, and having a known quantity makes, makes a big difference. Um, in the context of the third one, um, I think there would be, have been some merit in doing that. Um, and I think it's been done elsewhere. Um, and then look, I'm, I mean, um, it's also a question of cost 
and, um, and and how much you want to do that. What what I often find is um, um, environmental tracer can become quite expensive when you start to think about isotopes. Um, if you do, uh, if you rely on salts and ma uh, major iron, that's obviously cheap, but um, but the price per sample can become you know relatively quickly cost prohibitive. So. It's possible, but it depends on how much, you know, it comes back to the, the, big, the big question at the start. Um, what, what is the price of the uh, answer that you're trying to, uh, to provide? Alrighty, thank you. And um, more specific questions. Um, what is the brand model of the fluorometer in, that you showed in your presentation? That's a really good question. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure on the top of my head, I know the brand. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a, you can, you, you may want to reach out to me after the call, so the details are shared. Um, but there, there are several brands and, and, and they, they're more and more. There is one that I, if, if you, there is one that I'm watching on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, it's it's a it's a Belgian firm from the French-speaking part of Belgium. He's a really young guy, like he's, he's in, in his thirties, and invented a pretty nice type of um, uh, uh, fluorometer that um, that is even better than the one I've showed. Um, he's just he, he's not selling them; he's renting them. But um, but he, he's got a service associated with that. So um, yeah, um, sorry for not <laughs> answering that question right away. But in some ways, I think it's also it's important to me. It's part of the design too. It's it's good to be aware of the different monitoring devices and the pros and cons because that can also affect the outcome. So perchance, was it a, uh, um, hold on. See, Mike mentioned specifically, um, an Abelia FL24. I think that might be that, yes. Well spotted, Mike. But, um, um, that that, that might, they, they, there are some changes in ownership in for that one, <laughs> and it may not necessarily be may no longer be available through that particular supplier. So it, it's also a rapidly evolving <laughs> area. A um, couple more questions here. Um, one question is: um, missed the injection rate for the Golder example. Um, that the breakthrough is quite quick. Uh, do you recall the injection rate there? there? There wasn't really an injection rate. So that was a, like, um, a, it's called DRAC, which is a near instantaneous injection. So, uh, so pretty much it was based on uh, the volume of within the well um, and how to displace that volume. That was it. Nothing really fancy. <laughs> Um, how useful are tracer tests for determining whether groundwater is discharging to a surface water body? It's from Stephen. That's a really good question, Stephen. <laughs> Thanks for asking that one. Um, look, they, they are useful, um, but it can be also, it, you know, you need to have a pretty good idea of what your discharge zone or discharge, discharge point is. And uh, that takes a lot of work uh, in itself. And, um, and so it, it's possible, I've, I've done that, but, but there is a lot of upfront work in understanding the CSM. Um, there, there, there are ways, um, and that was an example where I also, I'm also very mindful not to ask to, you know, um, a number of um, cases that I have, um, uh, they ultimately belong to clients, <laughs> but um, so. But one example that um, that I've done to try to help with that was not was um, there is actually a uh, tracer technique 
that you can use um, that we we've used um, to assess um, the behavior. No, sorry, I um, I, I went a bit too. So so yeah. So it's essentially, it's possible, but you need to have a, a pretty clear idea about where the discharge point is, um, or you you have different hypotheses and then you may want to use a number of um of fluorometer at those locations um, that that being said um if you're in that situation you would want to use some of the cheap major ions and tds and whatnot uh, approaches beforehand and then the tracer test becomes the ultimate verification of the hypothesis that you have developed with multiple lines of evidence. That's probably a better way to look at that. Now, now the other thing I wanted to say is um, um, often in Australia, because all of our cities are along the coast, um, the aquifers are tidally influenced, which makes things a little more complicated. Uh, but a technique that we've used to help bringing more lines of evidence is, um, and using tracers, is uh, there is a technique that consists of uh, drip feeding uh, a well uh, with a tracer. And that tracer is going to be diluted by the through flow through the well screen. Um, and, and so if you're able to measure the concentration of the tracer within the well that is being drip fed, it's a direct measurement of the groundwater velocity. And, uh, and that varies as you, as you, as, as the tidal, um, um, the, the, the tide changes. Um, and, uh, and then depending on how close it is from the discharge point, it can have a specific response. And we've, we've done that on a transect to try to better understand where the discharge point was. And uh, it's just in this case, the, the, the discharge point was a little, was not at the end of the transect, it was somewhere in the middle because there was a particular uh, feature that uh, that acted as a preferential pathway. So that was a long answer, but but I hope it generally answers your question, and I'd be more than happy to discuss that with you uh, um, um, for lunch at some point. <laughs> All right, and we've got one final question from Giuseppe. It says, "Hi, Fred. Uh, would it what would be the ideal ground coverage, i.e." plant spacing per square meter, ideal to improve water retention or increase field capacity in a state like Victoria with approximately 500 millimeters of rain per year? That, that, I'm not sure I understand the whole question. So can, can you repeat that? <laughs> so sure. if you have 500 millimeter of rain per mm -hmm. year, what would be the Ideal the ground coverage. Um, of plants, I would assume, to improve water retention or increase field capacity. Hmm. Um, well, look, I, I think. Um, I mean, I think. I think at the end of the day, um, I'm not sure whether you would want to engineer groundwater recharge naturally. <laughs> You, you can do that, <laughs> um, but if you rely on a natural coverage, um, I think to me it's to try to rely on a diverse vegetative cover. Because um, ultimately plants helps uh, improving the retention, but also cleaning the water before it gets to groundwater. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question because um, because it, it almost begs the, can we engineer Mother Nature? And I'd be saying, well, no, Mother Nature is probably a better um, environmental engineer than us. And um, 
And so I would more rely on observing observing um, that particular location, try to assess what would be the best cover naturally with some experiment, and try to enhance what happens naturally um, based on these experiments, rather than coming with a rule of thumb and hoping that we would we would make the world better, because that's a little bit, um, um, I think we are preempting a bit too much our role on, on this planet if we do that. Um, yes, well, yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that should conclude um, this uh, uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, very informative. Thank you again, Fred. Um, I enjoyed that a lot. And I hope everybody else that attended um, enjoyed that too. And everybody who answered questions or who asked questions, thank you very much. And hopefully you got some good answers. So once again, uh, thank you very much, Fred. And thank you everybody, everybody for attending. Have a good weekend. Thank you. And don't, don't hesitate to reach out if you've got more questions. I love to talk about, I love to talk and I love to talk about traces. <laughs>